he keeps me singing. Page 434. Standing as we sing. 434.
that. Let's all stand, turn to page 426. Dwelling in Beulah Land, 426. Standing as we sing. Let's hear a few praise gods down there in the chorus, all right? Here we go, page 426. the young people about wisdom. And wisdom is one of those commodities that uh, you can have wisdom, but that doesn't mean that you use wisdom. And uh, there are things that we know and things that we do or don't do. Like, we know it's not best for us to be fast to frustration and to have a troubled spirit. But is that something that we do? And so the theme this month has been to humble yourself. It's humility that gives us the access to the wisdom that God offers so that we can apply it to our lives. And I'm sure you'll enjoy the skit, the verse, and the song. Control my fear and my pride. Controlling my anger, can't you tell? I can see. What's that kind of 
job, didn't they? I thought about that, humble yourself on the side of the Lord, the Lord looks on our heart. Sometimes it's a lot easier for us, as difficult as it is to humble ourselves before one another, than it is to humble ourselves before the Lord. And uh, We should uh, avail ourselves uh, to the Lord's working in, in our life. And then I thought about Michaela's part up here, how all the kids did great. But I thought about all the practice she's had at home. <laughs> With her brother. Yes, yes, yes. yes, we love you, Donovan. We're commanded to do so. A couple of announcements here before we take our offering tonight. Uh, obviously, it's good to have everyone here tonight. Glad you're with us. Good to have guests with us, as always. I hope the service will be a blessing to everyone. Certainly enjoyed the the, uh, the service thus far, haven't you? The Lord works good to us. Uh, remember, ladies, the uh, deadline to sign up for the ladies' dinner will be this next Sunday, so a week from today. And you can go ahead and give your uh, dinner uh, expense money there. That's $10 to either uh, Audrey or Andrea. They'll receive that for you. If you're planning to come, you do need to get signed up so that they make sure there's uh, food for you. And we've got a good group signed up already, so we're excited about that. And then also mentioned this morning, we've uh, moved the mission conference uh, back a week on the calendar. So it's February 1 to 5 uh, this coming year. I know that's a few months away, but time flies, doesn't it? So we want to be ready for that. So if you're making plans for your January, February time, time frame, please keep that in mind. I hope that uh, you'll plan to be here for Mission Conference. Always a wonderful week of the year for our, our church uh, ministry. And then teens, do remember the uh, Higher Call Conference is just a few weeks away. That's May 13th and 14th over in Indianapolis. We look forward to that. A lot of other events coming up in the month of May that we're excited about. Busy month for us as we close out the school year and all these all these uh, these things here. Let me mention to you if we have we can go ahead and have our ushers come. Let me announce a couple of uh, piece of information to you about the track distribution week. Uh, of course, we participated with the Jim Norton team in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan with a group of other churches. The, the main church there, of course, was Fundamental Baptist and. Ken Ross, which is where my brother Tom is serving in ministry, and the Raider family is there. 
Uh, the team uh, collectively, we as a church did 562. Uh, the team collectively was 10,774. So we praise the Lord to be able to participate in that track distribution. That was a week of, from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. A good idea. It's a great, great idea, great concept. So, Brother Ben, I want to ask the Lord's blessing on the offering tonight. Chapter number five. The title of the message tonight, Gracious Control. Mark, chapter number five. If you're able tonight, would you stand with me in honor of the scriptures as we read the word of God? We're going to read beginning in the first verse, we'll read uh, the verse 20. they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been off bound with fetters and chains, the chains had been plucked asunder by him. The fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains, in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. And he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. And now there were nigh under the mountains a great herd of swine feeding and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. Uh, there were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country and they went out to see what was what was that was done they 
come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid and they saw and told them how it befell him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine and they began to pray him to part out of their coast and when he was come into the ship. He that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Albeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go to thy home, go to thy, go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and how he had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men marvel. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word of God and the present power of the Holy Ghost. Lord, uh, we're confident tonight in the word of God and also in the ability of the spirit of God to work in our hearts. Uh, folks, everyone here tonight, our, uh, folks that have come to hear the word of God, and our, our trust is in thee, Lord. I pray that help us to not only understand the word of God but respond to it uh, whether that be conviction uh, of some kind or uh, simply a prayer uh, for those in need whatever our need is Lord meet those needs and may we praise you as we uh, we shout it tonight as we sang Lord may we lift up our voices and glorify you for what you do in our hearts well thank you in Jesus name The biblical account of this lost man shows us really an extreme account of a sinful life. How bad it can get. How terrible life can be. This man was completely controlled by an unclean spirit. You know, sin is always unclean. It's always unclean. Are you listening? Sin is always unclean. No matter who does it, no matter what their position in life, sin is filthy on the inside. The problem is on the inside. The problem is in the heart. At this time in America, we're overly conscious of outward cleanliness. People are... Uh, we have in our church, and I'm not criticizing this, but we have in our church uh, hand sanitizers. I think there's, uh, there, there was one up here. Yeah, there's one there, and there's one back there, and people wash their hands in the bathroom. People, uh, we, used to, we used to, after we'd sing, sing a song, we'd shake hands. We'd have a handshake, but we don't do that anymore because uh, we don't want to offend people about cleanliness. We're concerned about outward cleanliness, but I'm going to tell you something tonight. There isn't a whole lot of concern about inward cleanliness. As a matter of fact, it, for our country, it may be worse than it's ever been. It seems like who cares about within, but God does. Uh, the outward washings uh, is completely unconscious, and God cares about what's in our heart. In Mark chapter 7, just over a couple chapters, in verse 20 and through 22, the Lord Jesus here speaking, in Mark chapter 7 and verse 20, he says, and he said, that which cometh out of the man, uh, that defileth the man. For within, out of the heart of men, proceedeth evil thoughts, and adulteries, and fornications, and murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All of these things come from within, and defile the man. How concerned are you tonight about within your heart? What's on the inside? I'm so grateful that that's where God does his miraculous work. On the inside. Oh, it comes out on the outside. I think it's also interesting that these demons who were tormenting this man asked not to be tormented.
They also, in verse number six, they worshiped. Their worship was correct. They worshiped the Son of God. That was correct. They identified him as the Son of God, but their nature was corrupt. You see, there's a lot of folks that come to church, they come to the house of God, and they're, they're, they believe because they, uh, they're in the right place, and they're singing the right songs, and they're doing the right things, uh, that God is pleased with their worship, but God is only pleased when the worship touches your heart. It's, it, the Bible says that God will only be worshipped in spirit and in truth. See, they worshiped the right person. They may have even done it in the right way, but their nature was corrupt. Interesting, isn't it? I also thought it was very interesting how little Jesus spoke in the passage we read. You may not have noticed, I don't have a red letter Bible, but Jesus only spoke in verses 8 and 9 and verse 19. I thought that was interesting. You know, a, a lot of folks, when it comes to demons, they want to know all about them, but they don't want to know much about the Lord. Uh, you know, God always dealt pretty swiftly with demonic beings. Uh, he didn't horse around with them. When Satan himself tempted, came to tempt Christ, uh, he didn't. there wasn't a lot of verbiage there. He just quoted in Scripture and quoted in Scripture and quoted in Scripture. Uh, listen, you don't need to mess around with the devil. And by the way, he's real. Let's notice a few things I, I believe will be helpful tonight. Notice, first of all, in verse number 8, For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Evil or sin must go. You know that true salvation is as much delivering from the curse of sin as it is being in Christ. Delivering from the curse of sin. Repentance doesn't cancel sin. God does. You say, well, we all know that. No, you can go through the motions of repentance, but we have to have a miracle to have our sins forgiven. It's not automatic. Uh, and sometimes we think, well, I, I did things the right way. Uh, the Bible says the right way is by faith in Jesus Christ. And it's, it's, a, it's turning from our sin and turning to Christ, the only one that can forgive our sin. You see, this man was full of demons. Uh, they, their name was Legion. Now, we don't know this, how many that means. Uh, but at that time in the Roman army a, uh, or the, the Roman soldiers whatever they called them, armies, whatever they called them, but uh, a legion was about three to 6,000. Uh, that's a lot of demons if that's the number they're going by. Uh, this man was in bad trouble. Uh, and, and we notice how, uh, from our point of view, how easily the Lord handled them. And by the way, bacon was cheap that week. <laughs> I don't know if it was smoked or not, but it was salted. <laughs> You see, you see, and, and let me say this, we must be delivered from sin. We cannot deliver ourselves, and that's my point. You say, well, preacher, I'm, I'm, I, I got my worship right. I'm, I'm giving to the church. I'm supporting missionaries. I'm, I'm doing all these things. No, uh, God is the only one that can deliver us from the power of sin. Whether that power is unto hell or whether that power is in our life, we need Jesus Christ to deliver us from sin. He's the only one that can. No one else can. And it's through the precious blood of Jesus Christ, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. It's only through the blood of Christ. And that's why, and that's why liberal preachers and modernist preachers would like to get rid of the blood of Christ. They want to hear about it. Uh, well, it's the death of Christ. No, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission or forgiveness. And Jesus just spoke a few words. Come on, 
I was a man. You know, I don't remember everything that happened when I got saved, but I know there wasn't much to it. I was under so much conviction. I remember the preacher was very serious about it. He told me what to do, and I did it. And I, I trusted him, and I believed the word of God, and God, by his grace, not by my ability or my verbiage or getting everything in the right place, he saved my soul. And he forgave my sin. I can't explain to you, but I hope you know what I'm talking about. It was like a burden was lifted from my shoulders that I, I didn't have to carry anymore. The guilt was gone. The guilt of my sin. You see, I didn't know how guilty I was until I heard the word of God. I thought I was just a good fella. Just matter of fact, I had a lot of proof of it. I could tell you about the people that I were better than them. I think the preacher preached about that this morning. But that doesn't help. Jesus Christ is the only one that can deliver from sin. And it takes a miracle. I want you to notice, uh, secondly, uh, in verse number 15. Got to get back to our text. Uh, verse number 15. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil. <coughs> And had the legion sitting clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. I want you to notice, first of all, then, is sin, and secondly, the Savior. Uh, we, must, we must come in salvation, not just, uh, salvation isn't just the absence of sin, but it's the presence of Jesus Christ in your life. Do you know how tonight you know, if you know, that you know that you're saved? It's the witness of God in you. By the way, that struggle should be over. You should know that Jesus Christ is in you. You should know the presence of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, preacher, how can I know that? Ask God to show you that. Search the word of God to have God give you the assurance of your salvation. You know, you really can't make someone else understand assurance. They have to come to it themselves. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not just the absence of sin. It's the presence of God. I'm so thankful for the presence of God uh, in my life. And I've seen the presence of God in the life of others. What a blessing it is. Uh, the pastor was in the foyer this morning. I was back there and there was a bunch of fellows. And, and, uh, and they were talking and the women were talking over here. And the foyer was full of people. And it sounded like... Oh, 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 oh. I, I told the pastor, I said, that's, that's the sound of God's people having a wonderful time. Uh, that's the sound of the Lord's people. Fellowship is so special. It's so sweet. Uh, but uh, the, the uh, salvation isn't uh, just the absence of sin. It's the presence of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 12, in verse 43, uh, you see, it's not just the absence of sin. Well, how do you know that? Let me... Let me read verse 43 in chapter 12 of Matthew. The Bible says, And when the unclean spirit has gone out of the man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Now this is a person that outwardly got their life straightened out. In other words, they turned around. In other words, there are probably some things they didn't do anymore. Uh, they, uh, they got their life straightened out. Uh, it says in verse 44, And then he saith, I will return to my house. This is the fellow that got his life straightened out. Whence I came out, and when he, when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. By the way, uh, God, when he saves you, doesn't give you an emptiness. He gives you a fullness. He doesn't give you the absence of peace, but the presence of peace. And then verse 45, this is an awful thing. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also under this wicked generation. What are you saying? I'm saying that salvation isn't just the absence of sin. Salvation is the presence of God. And thanks be unto God that He is willing to be present in our lives. This man was gloriously saved here in Mark chapter. Mark chapter 5, what a, what a beautiful 
uh, sight it is uh, when someone truly gets born again, when someone gets saved. I mean, it's so exciting. Whether a child or whether, uh, whether 80, 90 years old, doesn't make any difference or, or past that. Uh, what a blessing it is when someone gets saved. Glory to God. It's, it's the most wonderful, wonderful thing in this life. But it takes a miracle. It takes a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What a blessing it is to be saved. If you're not saved here tonight, you're going to have to be honest about it. You're going to have to ask God to help you. The amazing thing is, he will. He'll help you. He said, Jesus said, come out of the man. And right then, things change forever in this man's life. Uh, we must be delivered from sin's control, and God is the only one that can do that. Amen. Notice with me again, verse number 15. And they, and they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil. Now, these people knew this fellow. They tried to restrain him. They tried to deal with him. They, were, uh, they, uh, they couldn't understand how to get a hold of the problem. Uh, him that was possessed with the devil and had uh, a legion sitting clothed in his right mind and they were afraid. <clears throat> you know, this is a very interesting passage. It really says a lot about the Christian life. You may say, well, that does. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of truth right here. Notice, first of all, he's sitting. Why does it say that? He hadn't done that in a while. He ran through the, through the cemetery, the graveyard, the tombs, cutting himself, probably screaming, yelling. Would have been an awful thing to see a person like that. He, he previously also had miraculous strength. He said, well, no, don't think that, the, that the Satan is, is, uh, can't do things. Some say, well, I saw it. You might have saw it. It might have even in our eyes been miraculous. Don't equate everything that is miraculous. It came from God. Well, how do we know whether it came from God? Know the book. Know the word of God. By the way, the greatest miracle in the Bible is that of the new birth. That of being born again. So he's sitting. He previously had lived in a rage. You ever see people live like that? They're angry at everything. They're just angry. What's wrong? I'm just upset. Why are you upset? Well, you don't understand that. I probably don't. But I know what you can do about it. We heard a skit about it tonight. Why was Michaela upset? We have no idea. But she played a good part, didn't she? <laughs> I'm just mad. We, and, and this fellow lived in a rage. Notice also he was clothed. He didn't have any clothes on before. Try to explain that to your kids. Who's that guy out there yelling and screaming, running through the cemetery, cutting himself, and he doesn't have any clothes on? My goodness, what a mess. How terrible that was. And realize at the same time, are you listening? This was a man. This was a person. So we just want to get away from him. That's what you would do, wouldn't you? I'll tell you, I get around some people and I'm very uncomfortable. They need the Lord. And perhaps I'm the one that needs to tell them about it. Perhaps you are. You say, well, I just want to be comfortable. You probably won't lead very many people to the Lord. And that's why we're here. He was clothed and in his right mind, verse 5, <laughs> or, or, excuse me, uh, verse, uh, verse 15. <clears throat> but it's also extremely interesting that they were afraid. Now they're afraid. You say, preacher, I'm not understanding. You just live out your Christianity and see the reaction of people. They'll be afraid of you. You go to church three times a week. You read your Bible every day? What's wrong with you? You don't you don't cuss? Well, there's nothing wrong with cussing, a little bit of cussing, is there? You don't drink? Yeah, water. <laughs> and I used to drink Coca-Cola. Well never that's a long story. I still do something. 
You don't drink. You don't take drugs. No. Well, you must have a boring life. Well, I have a wonderful life. I didn't even know life until I met Jesus. Oh, let me tell you something. He was in his right mind. If you're in your right mind, people are afraid. I think of, uh, I listen to a lot of preaching. I listen to Lester Roloff. And Brother Roloff ran homes for for uh, girls that got in trouble and boys that got in trouble that were, had to go to jail. And he, the judge would call him, come down and get this young boy. He's, a, he's in a mess. See if you can help him. And he had a home for drunkards and a home for drug addicts and, and uh, people in need. He had homes for all these people. And he was, he'd take them in and he would, he, they didn't have any television sets or radio. Uh, they would uh, they would work and they would pray. What did they work? They worked a farm. Uh, they would pray and he gave them a steady diet of the Word of God. And almost, not always, but almost always, they'd get saved. And I saw some of them at one time and it stirred my heart. Some of the sweetest. I saw a young girl one time and she's one of the sweetest little gals I'd ever seen in my life. And you could just tell Jesus was all over her. I mean, just see the Spirit of and then I heard she was one of the roll-off girls. And I heard a little bit of her testimony. Oh, God's so good. Well, Brother Roloff, he ran those homes, and the state came in and said, you can't do this anymore. He said, why not? He said, you're not going by the minimum state standards. You need to go by these standards, or we're going to close you down. Uh, Brother Roloff said, what's your success rate? That's I think that's a logical question, don't you? They pretty much said it's none of your business because their success rate stunk. <laughs> By the way, it still does. They said, well, we want to bring, give you our minimum standards. So Brother Roloff thought about it. He went down to the welfare office and he took his Bible and he said, look, what we're doing is working. I want to bring you our minimum standards. They said, sir, don't you know where you are? This is a government building. And you can't have that book in here. He said, yes, ma'am. They came back out to one of his homes and said, uh, we brought our minimum standards. He said, well, this is a church ministry. Don't you know where you are? You say he really did that? Yes. God delivers people in amazing ways. And it's wonderful to see. I want you to notice lastly in verses 18 and 19. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. That's a pretty good request, isn't it? Jesus, I just want to be with you. I can't find anything wrong with that, can you? Jesus, I just want to be with you. Notice verse 19. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. I want to say to you tonight, and I want to talk to you, those of you tonight that are believers, which I hope was everyone, but that's, that's between you and the Lord. How many believers fail right here? Hey, what do you mean, preacher, fail? You see, Here's a man that had gotten saved. And he asked a wonderful question. Lord, can I be with you? I just want to be with you. You know, sometimes we want to do a good thing, but it's not the right thing. Are you listening? Sometimes we want to do a good thing, but it's not the right thing. 
Sometimes in the eyes of men, it may be even the best thing. I, look, uh, let me try to illustrate this. I don't know that I can totally, but I've seen, uh, when, when we first started having mission conferences, I surrendered every year. I'm not, I'm not trying to say, well, what spiritual guy you are. I just, oh, Lord, Lord if you want me to go, how could you not? Seemed like the right thing to do. But that's not what God wanted me to do. What I'm saying is sometimes we've got the idea that if it's a good thing and it's a right thing, that it's God's will. This was a good thing. This was a right thing. But it wasn't God's will. We, as believers, need to listen to the Holy Spirit and discern the difference. Well, preacher, I'm going because I'm going there because people need the Lord. Uh, have you ever looked around? This is very deep. You can go across the street, people need the Lord. You don't have to go far. But to serve the Lord, you need to be in his will. Most of us as believers, most of us as believers, want God to rubber stamp what we want. And, we, and many of us miss the will of God in the living of our lives. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm not saying you don't know the Lord. I'm not saying you haven't been baptized by immersion in water. I'm not saying you don't give and give to the church and give to missions. I'm saying the will of God is the most important thing in our life. And it's not just doing a good thing. It's doing a right thing. And the right thing is being controlled by the Spirit of God. And that's the difference. Because someone that's controlled by the Spirit of God not only obeys the word of God, but they do it in the right spirit or the right attitude. You see, what we want may not be evil nor look wrong. This man said he just wanted to be with Jesus. You know, to a lot of people who are saved, doing right things is almost a good luck charm. In other words, if if I tithe and I give to missions and I'm faithful to church and I read my Bible every day and I pray, God's going to bless my life. Those are good things, amen? amen. Almost sounds like Psalm 1, doesn't it? What about the will of God? Well, preacher, how do you know the will of God? You listen to the Holy Spirit. Be not drunk with wine, what's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That's a command. We're commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, it's not just a, a, I got saved from sin and I have Jesus. It's what's next? The will of God. By the way, way the will of God may not be, listen, are you listening? May not be the thing that you're most comfortable with. You know, most of the great preachers I know or have known through the years have testified that they're introverted. That's why I'm not a great preacher. I'm not an introvert. I remember uh, Dr. Tom Lowe, and I couldn't believe it when I heard him preach. Man, he preached powerfully. And I got I went down to college and got down there and listened to him preach. And when he'd preach in chapel, everybody say, man, it's going to be good today. Doc, uh, Doc's preaching, man, it's going to be good. It's going to be wonderful today. And I'd see these great preachers. You get around Dr. Malone, he'd slip out of the auditorium. You hardly ever see him. He, he, he was introverted. What I'm saying is he wasn't comfortable. Man, could he preach. See, it may not be what you're comfortable with. It may be the will of God for your life. And if you'll do that, are you listening? You'll find the comforter will comfort your heart. I don't know anyone, I've never met anyone that's comfortable with soul winning. I know some, I've known some great soul winners. We had the, the Jim Norton contest. Probably, probably numerically the greatest soul winner I've ever known in my life was Jim Norton. Now, Pastor Bullock was a great soul winner, but Jim Norton, he, he, I remember
ever somebody uh, went to Quamon Falls up to Michigan with him? They couldn't find him. He led seven people to the Lord. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about a guy, let's see, he's about this high. Love the Lord. Love the Lord. He just wanted to tell everybody about Jesus. You say, well, yeah, but he, he was comfortable with it. Well, let me tell you something. You ever talk to people, they're afraid of you. They think you're a nut. It's all right. Let them think what they want. They were afraid of this guy. You say, well, you're a, you're a religious fanatic. That's what they're going to say if you're so in there. You think there's only one way to heaven. Yeah, I just, I just believe the Bible. Believe what it says. And if you'll believe it, God will change your life. And, and, and by the way, he, at the end of this life, he gives you home in heaven. Matter of fact, he says you're never going to die. You believe all that stuff. Oh, man, I do. Why do you believe it? I got the down payment. I got the down payment. What do you mean down payment? The earnest of our inheritance. That's the spirit of God in your heart. What a blessing it is. See, this man was demon possessed. He had a legion of demons in him. And that day he met Jesus. He came and worshipped. But he wasn't doing it right. Oh, it looked right. It seemed right. But God straightened him out. Come out of the man. Jesus did say much. Come out of the man. Demons started squawking. Don't, don't send us into those hogs. Or don't send us away. Send us into those hogs. And he did. And they went headlong over a cliff. Thousands of them. And destroyed someone's livelihood. They had a fit about it. Came back. And then they saw the fellow's demon possessed. And they all got afraid. I, you know, there's a lot of things there that made me afraid. It wasn't the guy that was demon possessed. What about you tonight? Sins forgiven. Christ in your heart. This is kind of the hard one, but it shouldn't be. Really, it really should be. Are you in the will of God? You say, well, what's the will of God? Oh, boy. It's way out here. No, it's just a step. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. It's just a step. Well, what's the step? It's kind of like getting saved in a sense. What do you mean? Well, I remember when I got saved, I took that first step. That's the only one I needed to take. I was down here trusting Christ as my Savior. If you're here tonight without Christ, take that first step. God will save your soul. He'll give you a new heart. He'll give you life. He's the author of life. He loves you tonight. He'll save your soul. If you're here tonight, you don't understand what the will of God is, take that step and say, Lord, I don't understand, but I sure would like to know it. Would you show it to me? And then willingly obey him a step at a time. You'll find yourself right smack dab in the middle of the will of God. And there's no better place in this life than in God's will. Let's bow our heads. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed and no one looking just for a moment. I wonder if there's somebody here tonight and you say, you know, preacher, I'm not sure I've ever been saved. Maybe folks think you are, but you're not sure about it. Would, would you just let me pray with you? Would you just slip your hand up and say, I've got some concerns about my salvation and I'm concerned about it. Would you pray with me about it? I'm, I'm not going to come around to you. Nobody's going to come around to you, but you'd say, I'm concerned. I'm not sure I know Christ is my Savior. Would you slip your hand up right now and just let me pray with you about it? Just so I can see it. No one else is looking around. No one's going to sing with you out. You just slip your hand up and say, pray for me, preacher. Is there one? God's convicting me. Oh, it's wonderful to know the Lord. Just put it outside. Our Heavenly Father tonight, if there's someone here without Christ, I pray they'd come and be saved. Lord, for those of us that know you, so often we find ourselves doing good things but not the things that you want us to. Help us to have the 
discerning spirits. Help us, Lord, to have attitudes that will search you for your will and do it with our hearts to your glory. I pray you bless the invitation tonight. If someone's heart's been touched, I pray they respond. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the testimony uh, of how you delivered this man that was so deep into wicked sin, and yet you changed his life with a few words following your salvation. Bless, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.